Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for waiting and please start your presentation right now. Okay. Um, well, let me know if uh, there's any audio uh, problems, but uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, or I'll not be here, but I'm very happy to uh, be able to present uh, today the status of embedded Linux. It's been uh, actually a little while since I've given this talk, and, and I had to do a little bit more research than usual, but uh, luckily, I just, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, I was able to attend the Kernel Summit and uh, LinuxCon North America, as well as Plumbers. A lot of interesting topics came up at, at that that we'll talk about. So, yeah, change to the next slide. So, this is uh, kind of my very, very high level overview. I like to talk about the kernel versions that have, uh, we've had over the past uh, year or so. Then we'll talk about technology areas, the CE workgroup actual contract work, our projects that we're working on this year, and uh, then just a, kind of a list of miscellaneous other stuff and I'll give you some links to some resources. So uh, next slide, let's, let's start off with kernel versions. Next slide. So as you can see, we're averaging about uh, five, five or so kernels a year. Uh, Linux 3.1, uh, was being worked on this time last year, and it had uh, a little bit longer um, duration uh, because of the kernel.org break-in. Uh, but since then, uh, we've actually been uh, averaging, I don't know, somewhere between 65 days or so for a new release. And in fact, our last uh, official release, 3.5, was in the middle of July. And that was about 60 days ago, so uh, we do expect uh, 3.6 to be delivered any day now. The last RC6, the last uh, release candidate was uh, was RC6, and that was just September 16th, just a few days ago. So, um, and an RC6, that's usually getting towards the top of the RC releases. So, uh, as I said, we should expect the next one anytime. Soon. And then the merge window will open up and we'll see what's going to flow in from Linux Next and other trees and stuff. So next slide. So just looking back over the last year, some of the things that have gone on, I've gone into the kernel. I'll, I'll go over these uh, fairly quickly uh, because I've covered them before, but um, it's kind of interesting to get a, an overview of the uh, features that are related to embedded that are going into the kernel every year. Uh, a lot of companies have not yet moved up to uh, some of these later kernels, and so it's useful to see what features they might be interested in. Uh, may might actually convince them to switch. Um, so in Linux version 3.1 about a year ago, uh, some of the things that went in were the watchdog timer core. Uh, it's a new framework for uh, managing watchdogging of the system. A uh, new framework for handling power management domains. Um, and then uh, multiple RMSOCs uh, now had device tree support. So device tree was, uh, was, had been added, the actual framework for device tree had been added prior to this, but uh, now multiple RMSOCs actually have that support in their board support packages. So next slide. In Linux version 3.2, we saw uh, the pin control subsystem. Um, and this was, uh, very useful, allowing uh, the control of multiple pins as named groups and allowing multiplexing. Uh, there was a really good talk on this by uh, the author, uh, Linus Wallej at ELC 2012. And uh, when I get down to events, I'll talk a little bit about um, that, that event. But uh, the documentation for this uh, subsystem is in uh, pin control uh, T, oh, not text. I have the period wrong in there, um, in the documentation directory. Um, and this is actually, I've been kind of watching this. Uh, I don't talk directly to this um, subsystem in some of the work I actually do, do as development at Sony, but I have been kind of monitoring it, and it seems like it's uh, getting a lot of, uh, a lot of people are using this uh, subsystem in the kernel. Um, Dev Freak, or device frequency, which is, uh, and I voltage and frequency scaling for non-CPU devices. That went in in uh, version 3.2 of the kernel. 
Uh, this is very useful for power management. So we're seeing a lot of the techniques that used to be applied to the entire um, kernel or the entire CPU are now being applied on a, uh, on a per device basis. So um, a lot of chips these days have the capability of being um, regulated such that individual parts of the chip can run at different frequencies and, uh, and that's uh, very useful for power management. Also in terms of power management, uh, quality of service, the, the quality of service system inside um, the kernel, this is along the same lines, now supports per device constraints. So you can put different quality of service constraints uh, into the system for individual devices that might be on the SOC. Uh, so basically a lot of good power management uh, features went into this release. Uh, next slide. In ARM Linux 3.3, this was a very exciting one for me personally. I'll get to that at the end, but uh, some of the things that went into this release were the ARM large physical address extensions. Uh, so the ability for uh, developers or software to, uh, to address uh, large address spaces um, also, uh, support for ALSA compressed audio uh, and a charger manager subsystem. Uh, the charger manager subsystem is interesting, it's a nice feature. Uh, a lot of times, the, about the only thing the main CPU is doing in an embedded device uh, when it's in idle is it's waking up to look at the battery and, and uh, control the charging electronics. And so this allows you to partially resume, uh, not do a complete resume, but just enough to resume to pull the battery and then resuspend um, for charger manager situations. And then the big news in this release, or at least from my standpoint, uh, was the Android patches that got put back into staging. So the Android patches had been in staging before, some of them, um, and this was uh, this uh, this was a, a little bit after the kernel summit that was held in 2011, where where these patches were discussed. And um, Greg Carl Hartman uh, put these patches back in, and uh, I'll I'll talk quite a bit more about Android mainlining the status of this. But this was the first Linux kernel that you could actually uh, run unmodified and uh, support an Android device. Of course, it didn't have. Um, some of the board support for uh, proprietary drivers for the graphics processing unit or anything, but a uh, very, very important step, uh, milestone for Linux in terms of supporting Android. Um, so on Linux version 3.4, uh, we had universal flash storage host controller drivers. So there's, um, there was a lot of different approaches to uh, talking to flash storage host controllers, and this um, this added essentially a driver framework for that uh, as part of the SCSI uh, interface. Also, uh, there was a lot of work done in the clock frameworks in the kernel uh, to unify the handling of subsystem clocks. Uh, this is one area where there was a lot of a lot of differences in the different uh, board ports between ARM SOCs, a lot of different ways the clocks were handled. And this, this tended to unify things, which was good. Uh, and then also the high speed synchronous serial interface. Um, so oh, this is a framework to allow communications between the CPU and other, um, other parts of the SOC, usually a cellular modem engine, uh, but it could be used for other uh, things, but uh, so high-speed synchronous serial interface. Uh, that's a framework into which drivers could plug in uh, to use that uh, feature in the kernel. And also, um, just what, a little bit more on 3.4. Um, this is uh, a, a pretty big release uh, for the DMA buffer sharing API. So the DMA buffer sharing is a way for different kernel subsystems to share DMA buffers, um, which there had not been really a framework for that uh, in the kernel. So each system kind of managed its own DMA, and if there was uh, any anything where you needed to take uh, buffers or DMA that was in flight and hand it off to another section of the kernel, it was a little bit ad hoc. Um, and so this DMA buffer sharing API um, 
really improve things from that standpoint. It was uh, part of this is related to a lot of the GPU uh, memory management work that's been going on uh, very recently. And then another thing that went in is the remote proc subsystem. So this is allows for control of other CPUs through shared memories. Uh, there's an RP message system uh, that allows for communicating with other CPUs, particularly running non Linux. Uh, this RP message system was used, um, is actually a, a standard that was supported by other non Linux operating systems. And uh, you can read up on that in some of the files in the documentation directory. So we're seeing uh, more control for essentially asymmetrical uh, processor setups and, and uh, where it, even where it's uh, Linux to non Linux communication. Um, so, next slide. <clears throat> now, in kernel version 3.5, uh, we finally saw some of the fruits of the big log rework that was happening. Uh, and this is actually the current kernel that's been released. You may not, in, unless you turn on specific options or uh, configuration items, uh, you probably won't notice a difference, but uh, the new, this version 3.5 kernel has the new structured printk support. And it's, uh, it allows you to output the kernel messages in a new format and to associate tags with each kernel message. Um, and this is, this was a very, very big change to a very core system in the kernel. Crit K uh, is very, very heavily relied on by kernel developers. And uh, to make a change to a fundamental operation the way that uh, Crit K operated was very difficult. This, this took quite a long time to get into the kernel tree, probably over a year of work. Um, I think this was first uh, discussed uh, way back in the kernel summit in 2011. And, uh, so it took at least six months for it to get in, and there was a lot of churn on the mainland most of the program. Um, has some, still has some kind of controversial features, uh, but in general should provide um, uh, things like system D or uh, other tools in user space that <coughs> need to parse kernel messages. It should give them a more regular format, and uh, it also, uh, the way that the timestamps are attached is a little bit better. Um, also, support for writing NFC drivers. There's a framework uh, put in for supporting NFC drivers. Over in Japan, you guys have had NFC stuff for years and years. We're just barely catching up now on Linux uh, doing some of this work in the kernel. Um, another thing is the integration of RAM loops and PStore. And so part of, part of the work there was to support the Android RAM console driver. That was something that had been mainline into staging, but now you're seeing uh, people start to pick apart uh, the Android features and put them in individually. And uh, so RAM loops and PStore are kind of wildly different way approaches uh, to the same problem, which is how to store information about the system as it goes down. Um, and uh, so it was nice to see some unification there. And then use probes, user space probes, uh, this is a set of uh, patches that have been out of tree for years and years. Um, but this is the ability for uh, the kernel to manipulate, well, a user does it, but through the kernel, manipulate the memory of uh, user space, essentially allow a K-probe-like uh, interface to um, be able to set uh, probe points, or, or they're not breakpoints, but they're kind of trace points up in user space and then uh, very easily monitor the activities going on with uh, that. Uh, and then finally, in Linux 3.5, uh, was Autosleep. And Autosleep, uh, I'll talk more about that later, but Autosleep is essentially uh, a renamed uh, weight blocks. It's a mechanism to allow the kernel to kind of aggressively go to sleep, and it essentially has the same semantics as weight blocks, uh, and it was nice to see this get in. It was a lot of hard work to come up with something that was satisfactory to the mainline kernel community and also that met the requirements of the Android developers. Uh, so 3.5 was a pretty big deal because that wait, nobody, a lot of people thought Wakelocks would never make it in and didn't make it in under that name. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, next slide. 
So Linux 3.6, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, as I was reviewing the uh, merge window for 3.6, I didn't find a whole lot of stuff um, in there that was, there was a little bit of stuff that Android RAM console functionality was integrated into the P store. So that was kind of finalizing some of that work that had earlier happened. And the way that that is gone in um, is going to be really useful for a lot of other kind of logging mechanisms. We're already kind of talking about the possibility of putting the Android logs into um, the, what's known as the persistent RAM uh, integrated with PStore. So, uh, so we're seeing these Android features uh, actually kind of make their way uh, into the kernel. Other than that, I haven't found a whole lot else, and I haven't had time to look at it really in depth, but, uh, but uh, it has not come out yet. When it comes out yet, I'm sure the kernel newbies will have their page up, and there's probably a couple nuggets in there that I've missed. Um, but this is all probable. Of course, it's on RC6, so it's very, very likely that, uh, that whatever is in RC6 will be the final thing that's in there. But so far, I haven't found a whole lot of embedded things. Of course, there's continual work on ARM board support packages uh, that I don't usually call those out individually, but there's been a ton of work, so it's not like nothing's happening in embedded, but it's uh, a lot of the board-specific stuff. Okay, so next slide. This is my kind of list of things to watch, um, things that uh, where there's a lot going on, uh, either and it's kind of behind the scenes, so you don't you don't see it very much, or uh, or if people are talking about it, it hasn't really made it into mainline yet. So device trees, we've been talking about that for years. It seems to be really be hitting its stride. Basically, all new ARM uh, board support packages have to be written in kind of device tree style. So you have to submit a device tree uh, for your board and then have the board support uh, integrate into kind of the normal places where drivers and, and IP block support goes. Um, but that's, we're still watching this kind of play out. I don't know, I think I saw a discussion about um, the possibility of actually having a kernel that did not parse the hardware for numbers anymore, that having it all completely device tree based, but uh, I, don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. In terms of Android features, there's, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about a long kind of list of Android features. Uh, kind of two big ones that saw a lot of work over the over the summer, uh, or not quite in yet, are uh, volatile ranges. Uh, and I'll talk about those, and then the ARM FIQ uh, debugger is something that's kind of neat in Android. Um, and there's been a lot of work to integrate that, to put the glue code in there, uh, so that you can call the up KDB from the ARM FIQ fast interrupt handler. Uh, a lot of, in ARM, there's been a lot of work on big.little, uh, and uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, big.little is a uh, capability to run the uh, same kernel on a core that, uh, a special core from ARM that has um, both an A7 processor and, uh, and uh, I think it's an R15, and uh, anyway, Cortex A, maybe it's an A15, anyway. It's a 15 and a 7, I know the numbers are right. Uh, but it allows you to um, switch dynamically uh, between those cores so that, uh, and the, the 15 is kind of a high performance processor, and the 7 is, has the same instruction set, but it's a lower weight processor. I think they have, it's got much less silicon, and so what happens is if you turn off uh, the A15, uh, you can save quite a bit of power when you're in uh, kind of a lesser idle state on the CPU. So you still have programs running. It's not it's not like you've idled the chip, but you can idle individual processors and get quite a big performance boost, up to 70% performance boost, even while still running programs. So it's kind of a different approach uh, to power management uh, than we've seen. But there's a lot of uh, kind of very difficult work that has to happen for that to work. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is a lot of consolidation in the ARM tree, a lot of refactoring to support the single kernel image for ARM. So I'm not a particularly big fan of this feature. Uh, it's the ability to take uh, to compile a single image and run it on multiple 
platforms. Um, so there are some areas where developers really like to do this. This is mainly for people like Canonical who want to support Ubuntu on mobile ARM platforms. Um, and to do that with a single image, that's very helpful to them. But uh, for us out on the bleeding edge where we have very, very custom hardware, uh, it's, I, I'm kind of worried about this uh, being, having a lot of overhead. Um, and so we'll have to see how that plays out. I, I feel like we ought to do some benchmarking to make sure that uh, kind of the extra overhead of carrying around support for chips you're not using is not uh, too bad. Okay. But those are some of the areas to watch. So the next thing I want to do is actually talk about specific technology areas. Um, and so in boot up time, um, so boot up time is kind of interesting. We are having, um, well, so free electrons is, uh, they were, they have been around the, the embedded Linux industry for quite a long time. And uh, they actually specialize quite a bit in, in uh, reducing boot up time for their customers. But they have a, they had a really great overview of known techniques that they gave at a Geneva conference last year. And uh, so if you are just starting out with reducing boot time, um, there's a lot of material on the eLinux wiki, but this, uh, I highly recommend this particular presentation. Uh, goes over all of the, covers a lot of territory and has actual numbers for, you know, what kind of techniques you can use. And it's all kind of a low hanging fruit, but when you, when you start working on a project uh, with embedded Linux, you know, usually in the cleaning up the boot time, reducing the boot time is kind of the last thing you get to, and you never have enough time to do as much as you'd like. Uh, but they show how, you know, a lot of techniques for kind of addressing boot time and how you can, in just a couple of days, you can uh, really cut your boot time down. Uh, and they have a service that they do with, where they audit your kernel and, and give a report and can do some knowledge transfer. So if you don't want to do it yourself, you can talk to the real electronic guys. Uh, they're very good at this. Uh, the other thing that I saw that just shocked me uh, related to boot up time was uh, the last, last year at ELC Europe, I saw System D uh, in Embedded. It was running on an Angstrom system, and uh, Colin Coy gave a presentation about this. And System D really is a rethinking of the entire uh, mechanism that uh, that we have for um, starting up processes. In, and originally written for desktop Linux, um, and starts services and demons on demand rather than uh, sorry I'm having some feedback on my audio mm -hmm. let me try to adjust my audio just a little bit okay, okay can you still hear me okay yeah uh, that's okay. important to include what Sound quality on our side also improved. Oh, did it? Okay. Good. Okay, so I adjusted my mic a little bit there. Um, so, um, System D. Yeah, so System D has a kind of a very, very different, instead of using scripts and a bunch of numbered scripts that all start in sequence, System D uh, starts things on demand uh, based on the kind of the communication between processes as processes start up. And, but it's always been a very heavyweight system, and so I never thought we'd start using it embedded. Uh, but people are starting to look at it, and actually I'll, I'll talk more about that later. We actually have a, a project in the CE working group to go look at the overhead there. Um, let's see, so next slide. So in terms of boot up time technologies, um, Snapshot boot is still, is, is kind of an old topic, but it's still very popular. This is, uh, a lot of products are, are using uh, uh, this type of thing to be able to uh, boot up their machines quickly. And another thing I saw that was very curious was uh, there's a, a new feature called suspend a boat, um, which is interesting, um, where the system does a suspend to both RAM and disk um, and, in, and then can go into an idle state, but still have RAM refresh. Uh, but it's nice because if the RAM loses power, it can 
it, uh, when you actually uh, charge the device and power it back on, you can un unhibernate to the exact same state from disk. And so it's kind of like kind of a safe way to suspend to RAM and still get kind of the benefits of a snapshot boot like thing. Um, and so this is that's kind of an interesting thing that has been added recently to the Linux kernel. I think that went in in, in 2.5. Um, next slide. In terms of graphics, um, I've talked about graphics uh, quite a bit in the past. But there's really kind of nothing new here at the API layer. Layer. I think it's pretty much settled down. You've got OpenGL ES as the de facto standard for 3D, and there's a little bit of difference between Android and uh, some of the other platforms, but there, there's been, not been a whole lot of movement. There's Clutter, there's Qt and X and, and uh, stuff. And so, you know, we know that frame buffer has been going away. Uh, larger screens on all the devices require acceleration. So there's not much new here. Yeah, next slide. Uh, but there has been, in order to improve performance, there has been a lot of work uh, for memory management between the kernel user space and GPU. And um, so Android has uh, this thing called DevION, which is um, it's a, a system in place for sharing, for buffer management to share between uh, all the different things in the system. And so this is similar to what DMA buff is, was doing. Uh, it allows you to share these buffers and pass them around inside the kernel and, and outside the kernel, actually. Um, and that was new in Ice Cream Sandwiches about a year ago. Um, and that's a replacement for PMEM. PMEM is essentially not being used anymore in Android. Um, uh, but in Mainline, uh, Mainline has addressed the same exact problem space, uh, and they're doing it with something called the Contiguous Memory Allocator um, and DMA buff, which I talked about earlier. And so they have, uh, what needs to happen really is these two approaches need to be harmonized and kind of unified. Um, and uh, there are people working on that. I don't think it's going super well, but I think uh, I think people recognize and and people are kind of friendly in a friendly way talking to each other about how to take the the best features of both of these and kind of integrate them together. I'm not sure when we're done if you'll be able to say you know well it's ion with CMA features or CMA with ion features. Uh, but this is this is kind of the big area. This buffer management turns out to be a big deal um, in order to achieve the performance you need with uh, with moving the graphic data around. Next slide. So in file systems, uh, pretty much with the sizes of the devices we're doing now, uh, people are not using some of the older uh, file systems. Occasionally, you'll run across JFFS2, but most most of the new devices that are using um, kind of traditional flash or UBIFS. Um, and so some work has gone on that. Uh, one of the things that the forum funded last year and actually got completed this year in, in, uh, was in April or May, the fast map support uh, for UBIFS. I think that just barely got into Mimi I need to check on when that made it in. But uh, so we are continuing to improve the feature set for UBIFS. Uh, there's AXFS, which is a, an XIP file system. I don't know how many other companies are doing this, but Sony is using this, and we've actually been working pretty hard the last couple months uh, to prepare, prepare for a mainlining effort, so we'd like to push that upstream. Uh, and another one that I didn't, uh, sorry, I forgot to get it on here, is um, Samsung has been working on something called F2FS, uh, which is a new flash file system that uh, and they will be giving a presentation on that at ELC Europe. Um, and uh, they, uh, they are also working on preparing that for mainline. They didn't have patches ready to, to uh, ship out to people when I talked to them. Uh, I saw them at LinuxCon in August. Uh, but uh, so there, there are some uh, pretty interesting kind of traditional flash-based file systems out there, and they are improving. So for example, the Samsung uh, file system it addresses uh, the, essentially the random write performance that's been a really hard problem for uh, these types of flash file systems. Um, so the next slide. The big area, though, of research, and well, another big area of research is uh, block-based file systems. 
So lots of companies are starting to use EXT4 on their embedded systems uh, because they're using EMMC. Um, and it's because the prices of EMC, EMMC parts have come down and uh, the integration cost, putting EMC, in the EMMC on your board is just easier and faster to do. Um, and so there's a lot of desire to optimize the Linux block file system layers for Flash. So Arne Bergman has talked about this. Uh, there was a good talk by Ken Tuff at ELC 2012. Um, and actually, the, this is such an important topic that the CE workgroup has decided to fund a project to uh, analyze the file system performance and, and also produce some results, uh, hopefully to help developers tune their systems. Um, to use EMMC. So uh, it turns out to be a fairly difficult problem because each EMMC part has kind of its own semantics. It's a black box. Um, and there's some algorithms going on in there in terms of the way they manage the race block sizes and they have internal caches. And, and, but So it's a difficult problem. But uh, in the CE workgroup, we'd like to at least uh, provide some documentation to help people uh, address that problem and deal with it, um, help hopefully help people tune stuff. Okay, next thing, next slide. So power management. So runtime power management is uh, kind of a big thing. Uh, so we have the relatively new ability to suspend and resume individual system components. That's not super new. That's that's actually been in there a little over a year. Uh, we have device power domains. Uh, and this is again uh, a set of devices sharing power resources, clocks, and power planes can be grouped together and managed together. Uh, and so that's very useful for uh, power management. Uh, next slide. But the big news is the, this auto sleep thing that Rafael Wysocki. Rafael Wysocki uh, probably worked a good year to try and come up with something that was wake clock compatible solution. And he was pretty funny when he put this in. He said, this series of patches uh, tests the theory that the easiest way to sell a once rejected feature is to advertise it under a different name. So he has uh, essentially it's wake locks, but it's called something different. And there are tech some, some technical differences in the code that finally made it uh, uh, suitable or acceptable to the mainline kernel. And it's actually in uh, Linux kernel version 3.5. So I don't know if the Android actual Android open source project has uh, modified their user space to use the new semantics. I, I don't know if they have because I don't think they, Android itself has moved to 2.5 yet. But, um, but uh, this is the features that they requested, I, I believe, are there now. So there's some more user space work that has to happen to kind of integrate it all together. But uh, we finally got something in. And there was a lot of people who thought this would never make it in. So that's, that's very good. The other thing that's been coming up, sorry, back one. The other thing is this power aware scheduling. So people are talking about the actual, you know, controlling the scheduling using um, uh, parameters or attributes of the power management of the tasks and of the whole system. And so that's a pretty new topic area. People have, you know, in the old days, we used to theorize a lot about this. You know, oh, someday we'll be able to actually schedule things based on the power needs of the device. But it's actually starting to come about. And these are not patches that are mainline yet. Uh, these are still kind of in the wings. People are working on it. But it's a very interesting topic area. So we're seeing a lot of uh, interesting features in the power management area that are, that are uh, waiting to go in. Okay, next slide. Okay, now system size. This is where it gets really interesting. <coughs> so there was a really good talk recently by Darren Hart. Uh, well, this is not super recently, last year, uh, talking about Pokey Tiny. And so the Yocto project has put together kind of a tiny distro. And that's a really good starting off point for looking at kind of the whole system size, not just kernel size, but system size. But in terms of kernel size, something that is really interesting that has just come up recently is uh, a developer by the name of Andy Clinton has been working on a thing called something called link time optimization patches. And uh, I have a whole couple slides here, I'm going to talk about that. But it is a, a pretty interesting new approach to uh, dealing with the kernel size. 
Um, in the CE working group, we actually have a contract project for doing kernel dynamic memory analysis. Um, and then also people have started compiling the kernel with a completely different tool chain, with LLVM instead of GCC. Uh, and LLVM, one of the main things, it has better error reporting, but one of the main things is it does more optimization. And so I think we're going to start to see some, some kind of a bigger impacts to the kernel size just from uh, compiling things a little bit differently. Um, it, outside the kernel, in user space, uh, of course, we still have all kinds of memory problems. Um, and so the big, the big things that we focus on there are the out-of-memory killer and out-of-memory avoidance. Those are the big issues. And, and uh, what you see is, you know, Android has a really excellent application lifecycle uh, where they can manage applications and they can actually uh, discard the way that applications are, are broken down into kind of small pieces so the individual parts of the app can be, uh, can be killed on demand. And, uh, but in a controlled fashion, so data is not lost and that type of thing. Uh, but then another area is this application hinting. And uh, the new big rage is uh, this thing called volatile ranges. And uh, that is the new hotness. That's a, a slang term for it. That's very popular now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, both the link time optimization and the, the volatile ranges uh, quite a bit more. So let's, let's go on. So for link time optimization, there's a really good article on that you can read in lwn.net. So basically the way this works is that uh, newer GCC uh, version 4.7 uh, supports a uh, capability of adding extra metadata about the routine. It's called a uh, GIMPL file format, and this is done at compile time. So when you actually compile a kernel uh, with link time optimization support, extra files will be put into the build directory. Uh, that describe um, the, a lot of attributes of the functions. And what happens then is when you actually get to the linking stage, uh, those files are read, and you actually get to do whole program optimization of the kernel at link time. So a lot of extra optimization data is stored when you compile, and then it's processed later. And, uh, but it's not as simple as that. There's, uh, there's a lot of kind of restrictions and and it's a fairly new feature that GCC uh, has. Uh, so Andy Queen has been working on this. He produced about 74 patches that added support to the Linux kernel for, for this LTO feature, uh, link time optimization feature. So a couple of the things that he had to do is he had to mark functions as visible uh, to avoid dead code elimination. There's a lot of functions in the kernel that are not called internally in the kernel that have to be around because of loadable modules or, um, well, basically, pretty much only because of loadable module, or because the assembly routines kind of jump into them from weird places, like the syscalls are in that category. Um, also, he had to adjust the compilation flags to be consistent. It turns out that in optimizing the code, uh, you need to be compiling the code all with the same compiler flags, or it gets very confusing. That's something that may be changed in the future, but that's kind of one of the constraints right now. And then the other thing is that uh, he had to add dependencies. There are certain features in the kernel that just cannot conform to the LTO requirements. And those are things that end up doing things like modifying code. So ftrace is one of those things. So ftrace does things like turn on and off code at runtime or rewrite sections of code at runtime. And that just does not fly with this, with this optimization. What we're doing is uh, in the tool chain doing a static uh, analysis of the optimizations. And so um, it, when you do dynamic stuff underneath, when you're doing code rewriting, uh, it just uh, causes all kinds of problems. And so you cannot currently do this LTO, link time optimization, and use ftrace. Now there are some ways you can get around that. People are talking about it already. Uh, but it's very interesting. So next slide, yeah. So, the cost, what is the cost of doing this LTO? So you get longer kernel build. It takes about four times as long to build the kernel, and that's not very popular. Um, it also takes a whole lot more memory, because uh, you can, uh, you're can you actually required to load in essentially all of the kernel symbols and all of the kernel text at, at once during the build. 
Um, it's not super bad. I mean, it's it's pretty bad, but if you do an all yes config for, for kind of a normal build, but if you do an all yes config, it requires up to nine gig to compile a kernel. And so you can't even do this on a 32-bit machine. Um, so, oh well, you can't do an all yes config. I think you might be able to do a, a kind of a normal build with, uh, with most of the specific modules. Uh, but the other big cost is the subtle bugs from optimizations. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, it's doing a lot more optimizing than it used to. And so it, bugs can crop up both in the compiler, the optimizations that it's doing, but it can also uh, point out bugs that the kernel, where the kernel is doing actually something wrong, but it, is, it doesn't show up until you actually kind of optimize and take into account what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, so. Uh, so there will be some bugs. This is not ready for prime time. It's not ready for uh, production use yet. But the long-term benefit, well, right now there's no size benefit, which kind of might be asking, well, why did Tim include it in his size area? Uh, the performance benefit, I'll get to that in a sec. The performance benefit, very preliminary benchmarks uh, by Andy show that uh, Hackbench is running about 5% faster and the network benchmarks, some of the network benchmarks that he did uh, went up to 18% faster. So 18%, well 5% is pretty good, 18% is like pretty amazing. And so there is the possibility that if we can get this all worked out, this will be a pretty big deal. Now right now he's not getting any size benefit, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a sec. So, why am, next slide, so why am I so excited about this if there's no size benefit? Well, I have actually recently, just for Sony, been doing some uh, research into automatic kernel reduction techniques. And it is just not tractable to reduce the kernel manually anymore. It's just too big to go in and try to manually configure everything and, uh, and understand all of the options. It's just not, not possible anymore. Um, and so there have been, though, a lot of research, uh, not a whole lot, but a couple of different papers on whole system optimization uh, as a way of doing automatic reduction. Uh, so instead of requiring a human to know about all the different options and how they interact and how to reduce the kernel, uh, some research have done, researchers have done a lot of work with whole system optimization. And uh, LTO, Link time optimization, and this is something that LLDM also supports. These represent the first systematic approaches to whole system optimization for the kernel. So this is really, I think, although it's it's just doing the baby steps right now. It's just now, you know, people are experimenting with it. I think this has the capability to be very significant. Um, some of the research that I've seen from other. Um, groups that have looked at this have seen size reductions in the kernel of up to like 25%, um, which is huge. I mean, that is uh, that is really a big deal. Uh, one interesting note is that this work obsoletes uh, all of the dash F function sections work that we had ongoing for years and years. And just as that stuff almost made it in, it never did quite finish getting integrated, but uh, having the compiler take care of all of this for you without having to, to do the function section work uh, makes this a whole lot easier. It basically takes Linux Tiny in a whole new direction. Um, instead of a whole slew of manual configs, which is what Linux Tiny did, uh, now we have the option to do a lot more automated stuff with the support of the compiler. So this is, this is I think, is going to be a big deal uh, for size in the future of Linux. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is kind of my uh, big long list uh, possible LTO benefits. So all of these optimizations you can't do unless you do a whole system optimization. So, but you've got all kinds of things like uh, dropping, automatically dropping uh, global function variables. So that's just dead code removal. But uh, the way it's done, it allows you to get rid of if defs. Um, and so that, that could actually clean up the code from a source level. There's partial inlining. Uh, so you can take actually just portions of code and inline them. Um, <coughs> You can uh, optimize the arguments to global functions, uh, which means you can drop unnecessary arguments, optimize the input and output fun uh, arguments. Uh, you can defect, detect function side effects. So a uh, caller could keep some things in registers. 
Uh, normally, you would not keep uh, a global variable in a register over a call, um, but you can uh, you can do that. Um, you can detect uh, read-only variables, not optimized for them. Uh, you can actually do some interesting things with indirect function calls. Indirections cost a lot of performance uh, and actually size in the kernel. Uh, and then the kind of a big one is you can do cost of propagation throughout the whole kernel, and you can do specialization functions. So uh, you could, if you know in one section of the kernel that uh, something can only have a certain value, you can use that knowledge in a completely different section of the kernel uh, to make some optimization. So you can, for instance, if you know that a certain variable can only take on two or three different values, you can look at some other section of the kernel that has a switch statement and uh, you can just eliminate all of the code that could not possibly be called based on that value. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, so there's a lot of possible benefits. So you can tell I'm kind of excited about this uh, feature and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how it develops in the next year or so. I, I think it'll be interesting. Okay, so next. Uh, on a completely different topic, volatile ranges. This is another one I kind of wanted to focus on because I think it's uh, pretty interesting. So this was some work done by John Stoltz, and it was inspired by the Android feature that was in AshMem. And you can actually see, if you look at, there are two LWN.net articles here. Um, the first one talks about his first approach to uh, adding this from AshMem, and he used a POSIX and advise or something like that. Uh, the next approach is kind of the one that is the current approach. So this is, this his implementation has kind of changed over time. Uh, but the basic idea of volatile ranges is it allows cooperation between the kernel and the applications on their usage of uh, what we call volatile memory. And volatile memory just means memory that can be discarded and the application can rebuild it if it needs to. So basically, a big, uh, very, very high level overview is the application. This is a new framework to allow an application to notify the kernel about reclaimable memory areas. And none of this is mainlined yet. It's still under development. Uh, John was at the memory, uh, memory mini summit at, uh, in August at the, at the kernel summit <clears throat> and uh, discussed a lot of the issues with the other developers. Great thing is all the other developers are pretty excited as well. They a lot of there's a lot of mainline support for this, so he's not getting pushback on the actual feature, just on the individual aspects of it. Um, and so it's it seems like it's going pretty well. So next slide. So here's here's a usage example of volatile ranges, and, and from this usage, hopefully you'll see how it can be used to uh, help uh, with low memory situations. So what happens is. An application allocates some memory and uses it. And so it puts, you know, allocates some memory from the kernel and some pages, and then puts a bunch of data in it. Uh, so sometime down the road, when uh, you know, as the it's a multiprocessor system, and so some some uh, well, multiprocessor system rather, and so some other processes need memory as well. So at some point, the kernel notifies the app that the memory is running low, and the application can actually look at that area and mark areas in that memory that it owns that can be recreated. So it may have like an image cache. If you think of a web browser, uh, there's a lot of things, especially as a web browser does layout, it has to calculate a lot of values. But it, it may, especially a browser that has tabs, right? You might have a tab that uh, is in the background. It's You've got the image data loaded, uh, you've got the, the image, the, the page laid out, which takes a certain amount of data. Uh, but that is all volatile. Once once the user covers up that tab with another tab, it's not really needed, and it can be reconstructed. Um, and what it does is, uh, so the, the application marks those areas that can be recreated as volatile. And then what the kernel can free those areas if it needs to. So now, what happens is, so as, as the, the browser application or whatever application it is, is swapped out, or not running, other the kernel may or may not end up using those pages. Um, so if the application wants to use the data then it, that it is marked as volatile, it tries to unmark it as volatile. So it goes back to the kernel and says, hey, I want to use those pages again. Someone has you know, clicked on the tab, and I want to see if I can expose that tab to them with minimal effort. 
Um, if the area was freed, then the call fails. So if the kernel took that memory and used it for some other purpose, the application has to go regenerate that data. It'll take a little bit longer to expose that tab in the example I'm using. But if the area was not freed, then the call succeeds. Okay, and the, it, the area is marked unvolatile, and the application can then use the data as is, and then it comes up quickly. And so it's a way of, uh, this whole thing is a way of uh, uh, applications cooperating better with the kernel and between themselves. To, um, to allow the kernel to manage memory better. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty neat system. A lot of users, even on, on the desktop, are interested in this, not just, um, not just embedded. Um, and so I, this, I think it's almost certain that this is going to go in uh, pretty soon, probably the next couple of kernel versions. And this will be a really interesting thing for people to use in embedded product. Um, I think that's it for volatile ranges yet. So um, the next thing up is the CE workgroup projects. So this is kind of taking a whole different direction. Um, so the CE workgroup projects, every year we um, just get together and we decide what types of things we would like to fund and that will advance certain areas of, uh, of the industry. And this is our list for 2012. We have eight projects that we've approved for funding and some of them have already started and uh, some have not. Um, for various reasons, where uh, we have only so many projects that we can juggle at a time, but uh, we have we have several that are going right now, and I, I'll just talk about these now. So next slide. So the first first project is this EMC EMMC tuning guide. So we are uh, this is a project uh, I talked about it earlier to analyze EXT3, EXT4, and B, uh, ButterFS on a variety of block-based flash parts. Uh, so this is what I was talking about, where we're trying to do. When I say block-based flash parts, I'm talking about EMMC and uh, maybe SD cards as well. <coughs> um, but the output from this will be a document describing the best practices for tuning Linux-based Linux block-based file systems. And so work has just begun on this. Uh, we got the contract uh, executed over the summer, and uh, and uh, the parameters for what what systems we're going to test are all set up. And so we should see some results. But I'm hoping that we'll actually have uh, at least the initial forms of the document by uh, embedded Linux conference here in a couple of months. Uh, but we'll see. So that should be helpful for companies as they start to use these flash file systems on, uh, on other uh, things. So the next one, dynamic memory reduction. This was a, uh, in, in, the Linux Tiny Days, so Linux Tiny was a project that worked on uh, memory reduction of the Linux kernel, and it mostly did it through uh, static time configurations. So you would tell, you would try to make the structures in the smaller, in the kernel smaller, you tell the kernel to at boot time allocate less, uh, less of something, less TTY structures, or you know, less, you use smaller hash tables, that type of thing. But what this project is, is, this project is looking at now, instead of just the static memory usage, the dynamic memory usage of the kernel. And so uh, we're trying to kind of, in a systematic way, go in and see if we can find some areas where we can continue to reduce uh, the memory usage of the kernel. Um, and so what we're currently, we're using uh, something called KMEM events, which is F trace infrastructure, and we're getting the reports on the dynamic memory usage uh, we actually already submitted some patches upstream uh, to improve the memory tracing infrastructure. So we need to start that as earlier as possible and boot up in order to see some of the boot time memory usage. Um, and those patches actually have been uh, accepted upstream and should show up in the next, they might make the 3.7 merge window, I don't know. We'll see. But we have a whole wiki page on this and some of the issues. You can go look at that. Uh, if you look at the next slide, uh, one of the things that part of this project is to do some visualization of the memory. And so this is um, showing that we have taken the allocations that are coming out of certain areas of the kernel, in this case, what we call drivers, and we show you, essentially, it's a, a ring chart. It's a pie chart, but it's exploded multiple layers. And so you can see in this diagram that uh, the driver base uh, allocates about 65k, 
and then uh, uh, you can see the um, TTY layer allocates about 17k. Of that, uh, 6k is in virtual terminals and 8k is in serial. Now this one is not very complicated, uh, but it does show you kind of uh, where the memory is being allocated uh, and in the system. If you look at the next one, next one here, so this is a little bit more complicated diagram, and this is just scratching the surface. So what it allows you to do is um, we, are, we are assigning the memory allocations uh, by kind of logical area, and this helps you get a better idea uh, for which sections of memory, well, which which systems in the in the kernel are using the most memory, and then it, it's broken out as you go out to uh, kind of subsystems and sub subsystems, and so this should this type of visualization should be very helpful uh, to kind of see where is the memory going. Now we also have, so this is just the visualization part of the project, we also have, are producing uh, reports from PERF about uh, the amount of memory wasted, uh, so we'll be taking a look at that. But uh, this project is going really, really well, um, and I hope to see some results. Uh, I've got a commitment from the developer to come to ELC uh, and show some results, so that should work. We're hoping that that will happen. We'll have some good stuff to show people about how to reduce the, the footprint of the Linux kernel, especially the dynamic memory footprint. Okay, next slide. Uh, another project that uh, we wanted to do, um, we may not need to, is uh, mainline the uh, ARM uh, fast IRQ debugger. So, and I talked about this earlier that uh, Android has a, a ARM, uh, a an ARM FIQ debugger that's built in. Uh, Android is uh, is pretty interesting. I talked to the guys about this, uh, some of the Google developers, and they actually have the FIQ hooked up on some of their phones uh, to the earphone jack. And so they can actually, they have a little device where they can plug it into the earphone jack of a phone and uh, get a serial console and a debug prompt, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So they got, uh, uh, but, and, so some of that software is not uh, really uh, pertinent to non-Android, but, uh, but this the FIQ debugger, so the thing with this is that the pro this project is on hold because uh, we uh, started looking around to try and find someone to do it, and it turned out that someone was already working on it. So it's Anton Baransov uh, is apparently already doing this work. I talked to a bunch of people at the Kernel Summit, and uh, especially the KDB maintainer. Um, and he said that uh, uh, this work was very promising and it looked, looked pretty good. Uh, the Google developers have actually been involved in some of the patch submissions, have been reviewing it, and it looks like that should go into mainline pretty soon. Um, so that's a project that we had hoped to work on, we may not have to. Uh, next slide. Uh, a lot of these have not actually started yet, and I'm going to be a little bit sketchy on the details on them, but basically a uh, connection manager, Conman, uh, does not currently have support for Wi-Fi Direct, so we're going to hire a contractor. We're in the process of hiring a contractor to uh, add that support. Uh, next slide. Uh, K-Exec boot, I have kind of a soft place in my heart for uh, Linux-based bootloaders. K-Exec boot is one of them. Um, and so we have a fairly small contract involved uh, here to improve K-Exec boot. Um, this is a bootloader that uh, actually uh, provides, essentially it's a very low footprint uh, user interface um, and then it uses actually Linux, it's uh, Linux image itself as the second stage bootloader uh, using kexec uh, and then it loads the actual kernel image using kexec. Uh, so, um, so we're finalizing the contract on that, we have some details about the types of improvements that will happen on that, but that's uh, for those of you interested in kind of a nice GUI low footprint uh, bootloader uh, that based on the Linux kernel, this, this is a good option. So and we don't have anything negative to say about U-Boot and Bearbox and some of those other ones, but this is, I, I kind of lean towards liking uh, Linux-based solutions myself. Um, anyway, so we're going to work on that one a little bit. Uh, the next one is SystemD and UDEV. So I talked about how SystemD is uh, kind of a big bloated thing and uh, 
So what we want to do is before we start using an embedded, we really want to kind of go out and measure it, uh, measure the overhead and the performance uh, of the system, of system D and UDEV, and see what the best way to use them in um, in embedded is. Rather than just let uh, you know, I I know Angstrom has an option. Uh, Angstrom is an uh, open embedded based distribution. They have an option for putting in system D. I think we before we just start seeing it show up and people don't really know what the what the kind of the costs and the benefits are. I think we want to go out and kind of measure those. And so the purpose of this project is to actually pay someone to go uh, measure those costs and benefits and, and produce some information on it so that as an industry we can kind of be more informed about where, where it's appropriate to use system D and UDEV and where it's not. So next slide. Uh, UBIFS robustness work. So UBIFS is great. A lot of people are using it. It does have some corner cases where if you cut the power right in the middle of a right, uh, it's possible to get corruption. And so one of the things we want to do is add support for power cut simulations to UBIFS. UBIFS has, a, has an error simulation framework. Uh, and this would be adding a, some power cut simulations to that framework that will, to allow developers to find and fix file system bugs. Uh, and we have not started that work yet. We're still in the process of uh, selecting a, a contractor for it. And then the last one is U-boot log buffer sharing. So uh, this is another project we haven't started yet, but uh, have approval to spend a certain amount of money to add support for U-boot and the Linux kernel so they can share their log buffer. This allows for easier collection of joint logs between them. And this might be a model, hopefully integrated with some of the persistent RAM stuff that we've been adding from Android to uh, allow us to get a combination of kernel and bootloader logs in a, in a single area um, and across invocations. So this, is, this could be a pretty interesting kind of technique that we'd use with other bootloaders besides just you boot. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's the, our short-term projects, the ones we're actually funding this year. So we have, well, and I should say that carefully, so we're funding these other ones too, but not in the same way. These are longer-term projects uh, that we're using uh, Linux Foundation resources on and um, so the first one is the Android Mainline project. I thought I'd give an update on that. And then I want to talk about the long-term support initiative. And I think I may in my slides have done this backwards. Oh no, there's Android Mainline status. Okay. So in the 3.3 kernel, I talked about this, um, you could boot the Android open source project. And we have, uh, there's been various industry meetings between Google engineers and between kernel developers. There's a status page on the eLinux wiki talking about this. And this was. Actually, John Stoltz, who's one of the primary people uh, leading that effort, gave a good report on this at the Kernel Summit, you can, the, just the one we had just a couple weeks ago. And so there's been a lot of progress been made. Uh, next slide. Uh, just some specific pieces that have happened. So we have wake locks, uh, which was a really, really big deal. That has been converted into something called auto sleep. Uh, Ashmem, part of the Ashmem functionality is now being worked on in the form of volatile ranges. Uh, the RAM console, Android RAM console, uh, kind of debugging features now have been put into something called persistent RAM that's integrated with the pStore uh, pStore feature. The alarm dev, or the, well, the Android USB gadget driver, uh, we've been working to get that integrated. Uh, the alarm dev. Uh, has been converted over to Parsec's alarm timers, and actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Android uh, user space has been converted over to use those POSIX alarm timers. There's the FIQ glue code uh, that is in the process of getting merged by by Anton. Uh, GPIO timers has been is uh, now there's some there were some additions to the LED trigger code. Um, not sure the status of those getting mainline, but I know. There's uh, developers working on that. And then the low memory killer, uh, I guess that was discussed at the memory uh, mini summit just a couple of weeks ago. There's, I guess, VM events may solve that problem. There's a lot of discussion about how best to handle. The main issue here is how does the kernel signal uh, user space that there's memory, uh, that, we're, that there's memory pressure, that we're low on memory. And Android has its own way, it's very specific to Android. Uh, kernel developers want to take that and kind of generalize it. There's actually already is, if you're using memory control groups, uh, 
uh, there's a way to signal low memory conditions, but people are looking at ways to uh, not necessarily use control groups and still get that signal. Uh, so that's, that's all stuff that's in progress. It's all uh, made pretty good progress. So if you look at the next slide, what's not been done? Uh, so the logger code, there's been a few cleanups, but nothing, uh, nothing to generalize it for other users. Uh, it's a pretty small driver, so that may not be that important. Binder, a few people have been talking about Binder and the possibility of, um, of doing, taking some of the features and putting them into device notifications and, and uh, dbus, uh, but uh, not much action yet, so just a lot of talk. Uh, the I.O. memory allocator, I talked about that. There's some, some work in progress to adopt those features in the DMA buff. And then the network security, nobody likes the network security stuff, but it's only about nine lines of patches. That may stay out of tree forever because it's uh, deemed pretty ugly. But the, the difference between you know, a mainline kernel and an Android open source project kernel um, on some of this long-term stuff is pretty small these days. Uh, it's smaller than, you know, Greg Crow Hartman said at the Kernel Summit, it's smaller than a single large driver and so it's not really fair to say it's a fork anymore. It's, uh, it's, it's gotten really good. Uh, next slide. In terms of meta issues, you know, the social issues have largely been worked out. Uh, Colin Cross, who's one of the main Google developers, was at the Kernel Summit. Uh, nobody's complaining around like they used to. Everybody's getting along. Uh, Lenaro, I have to give them some some credit here, Lenaro has been doing a lot of the proxy work on these features, so um, a lot of the stuff that's been getting in has not been by Google engineers. Some of it has been by Google engineers, but a lot of it has been by Lenaro engineers. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that Android is not using a continuous stream of kernels anymore. They used to use like every single kernel that came out. They were right on the bleeding edge. And I talked to the Android developers, uh, well, one, a couple of them at um, at the Kernel Summit and LinuxCon, and they said, well, they're going to kind of back off on that. They'll use, uh, select when they select kernel version, they're going to use it for a little bit longer. They're having a little bit too much churn in their uh, products, uh, the, the kernel trees and stuff. They're rebasing patches a lot. And so their current plan is to use 3.4, at least that's what I was told a couple of weeks ago, which is really good news, because uh, they'll be on the same kernel as a lot of other stuff. Um, and then, really, kind of no one worries about the Android fork issue anymore. There's still lots of work left to do to continue moving these features upstream, but I think it's all, it's all uh, people are moving it all upstream for kind of the natural reason that they see a neat, a neat feature that they want to have and they are, I want to work on and getting it in. It's kind of not this artificial, oh, you have to join because otherwise the press will report to the fork. Uh, so that's actually good. So Android is really doing well, I think, at mainlining. And uh, we may not be talking about this very much in the future. Um, the next one I want to talk about a little bit, I know there's a session in the afternoon where Waitasan is going to give uh, kind of more information about this, but I just wanted to do a little bit of a small report on uh, LTSI, which is a long-term support uh, for the industry kernel. There was a meeting at LinuxCon in the US a couple of weeks ago um, so one of the things is that uh, the kernel version, 3.4 will be the next LTSI kernel version. That's the next big thing. And it's not just uh, LTSI. When, uh, so Wind River is going to be supporting the LTSI uh, kernel. Yocto project uh, will be supporting that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. At officially supporting the LTSI kernel, that's very good. Android, although they're not specifically on the LTSI kernel, they will be using a 3.4 kernel. So there's going to be a lot of commonality between the Android tree and the 3.4 tree that the LTSI is using. The next, and all of this is based on the next community long-term tree is 3.4. That was announced by Greg Carr Hartman a couple months ago. Uh, so, uh, and just today, I don't know if, you, if you're on the LTSI dev mailing list, just today, LTSI kernel was opened uh, for contributions to the three top four uh, kernel release. So if you have a feature that you want to get into LTSI, now is the time to do it. So uh, next page. So Yocto project support, this uh, kind of took us by surprise, but it's very, very good news. Uh, so the Yocto project is supporting LTSI. 
Um, they're actually going to be supporting multiple kernels. The latest upstream kernel uh, is up to six weeks prior to the uh, Yonko project release and an LTSI kernel. And they're supporting that, uh, those kernels on five different platforms, uh, a QMU platform for each one and a physical board for each architecture. That means the kernel distribution will get testing on 10 platforms. You can see there, just a little diagram, the projected kernels for Yocto project releases. This is very tentative. This is not a commitment. This is just kind of what they expect given the time frames. This, is all, this can all change based on release time frames and things like that. So you'll see that uh, the first Yocto project release to actually uh, support the LTSI, that will support the 3.4 LTSI kernel will be in the 1.4 time frame. So probably. I'm not sure when the LTSI 1.4 comes out, but it will probably early next year, probably March, April time frame. You might guess. That's just a total guess, so don't don't quote me on that. Um, next slide. So the LTI, LTSI release schedule, not Yocto, but the LTSI release schedule is that currently the merge window is open for 3.4, just open today, um, and it should be that 3.4 release should be released by the end of the year, so sometime probably November, December. Uh, some of the features, um, uh, Greg said that um, LTTNG was gonna be in there and PramFS. Uh, a bunch of the other patches that were backports uh, of stuff that had gone into uh, 3.1 or 3.2 are no longer are needed in 3.4, so a lot of, most of the other stuff is gone from that. But uh, Sony is actually working on some AXFS patches. Samsung is working on some F2FS patches. And so I encourage anyone else who wants to contribute to uh, go ahead and do that. And that'll be good. Uh, next slide. Okay, so other stuff. I'm gonna go through this really quick. I'm kind of getting to the end of my allotted time and I don't wanna go over. But, um, so next slide. So just go and go really quick over uh, this stuff. Oh, next slide. So tools, uh, this, not a lot has changed in this presentation, so, but uh, QAMU, uh, if you're not using it for some of your testing, you're kind of missing out. It's an easy thing to do, um, to use for, for testing some types of kernel fixes. Uh, Eclipse is kind of the de facto umbrella tool for development. Now it's used by both Android and the Octo project, and I think all of the Linux uh, all of the major Linux distro companies are using Eclipse. And so if you're gonna develop a tool for embedded Linux development, it's probably a good idea to think about how it might fit into an Eclipse framework. With tracing, uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on with tracing these days. Perf continues to kind of build up a, a, a lot of uh, interesting features that are useful and uh, useful for embedded as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Octo project, some of the new things going on there, uh, they've got a, uh, what they call the hob uh, graphical user interface um, used to be you know it used to be all you just uh, all your selection with uh, editing files and your building using a command line tool now you can do it all in a graphical tool uh, another thing is that they have a builder image uh, so one of the things that's continually plagues build systems is um, how can you be sure that what you're compiling, that you're gonna get the same image every time. And so, you know, if part of your development team is building on Fedora, and part of your building uh, development team is using uh, Debian, and another one's using Ubuntu, <clears throat> well, you don't want, and, and they're using kind of different packages for things, for kind of on the host side, you know, a different version of make, different version of sed, or things like that. Can that affect your project? Well, this uh, builder image, solves all that for you. So it makes it so that each developer can run essentially a KVM image um, and you know that it's gonna, that, that what's inside that image is gonna produce the exact same bits that any other developer on your team is. So that's actually pretty good. You can, you can test uh, the Octo project with absolutely no external dependencies and you can have, be testing it on a weird distro um, and you should get out the exact same bits as everyone else. Uh, another thing in terms of the Octo project, the Sony is uh, adopting the Octo project. We haven't made a formal announcement about that, but that's uh, something we are working on internally. So if you're considering the Octo project, uh, think about it pretty hard. It's, I think it's uh, personal belief is that's the system we should be uh, working on together in the industry. 
Um, last thing here, let's see, Android. Just a couple of notes about Android. Jelly Bean, oh, sorry, that's my phone. I'm trying to turn it off. Um, the phone activations for Android are at 1 million per day. This is a Google I.O. Uh, and there are 400 million activations total. And uh, I saw something interesting on uh, LWN.net, some of the comments. Um, you know, Android is the largest installed base of Linux uh, in the world. Um, you know, and so at least by unit, by numbers, right? So 400 million. There's no, there's not 400 million other Unix user spaces on top of on top of Linux anywhere else. And so Android is 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 doing very well. Um, uh, there's this Ubuntu for Android, which is pretty interesting. It uses an Android device as a PC, um, so you can run Ubuntu. Well, it's a kernel. It's an Android kernel, I guess. So it's a Ubuntu kernel. Anyway, you guys know how that works. Um, but uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of Android in the future, even on uh, Linux desktop systems. Uh, let's see, events. So really quickly, uh, this is kind of the event list for this year. We saw a lot of activity February ELC, the Builders Summit. LinuxCon Japan was in June. We have these Japan Jamborees. We just had uh, LinuxCon in the US, Plumbers and the Kernel Summit. Um, ELC Europe is coming up, and I believe you people are the first to see the dates for ELC 2013. And it's the first this has been published. It's not even on the Linux Foundation website yet, but it will be February 20th through the 22nd in San Francisco. And so, um, so if you can make it to that, uh, we would love to see you there. It'll be a great, great time. I just did want to see uh, talk a little bit, just really quickly, a couple of sessions that I thought were really interesting from recent events, um, and interesting for different reasons. So one of them was if you're interested in this memory management stuff and the volatile ranges and how it fits into the grand scheme of things, John Stoltz did a really good presentation called Letting Go, um, and it's all about how to appropriately free memory under under memory pressure. And this is, a, so you can see his slides, and I, I don't know if there's a video of this one or not. I think there might be a video of this one. Uh, but you can go out to the Linux Plumbers Conference and look that up. Uh, the other thing is Mini Cord Ups by Thomas Fleixner, was I thought was a really interesting presentation. I'll, uh, I have a slide on that next. And the other thing at the ARM, and this is, this is not so positive, at the Kernel Summit, there is an ARM Mini Summit. And uh, I found myself shaking my head, wondering if they were going to talk about embedded. They kept talking about all this server stuff, ARM on server and ARM64 and big, little, and single system image and desktop and enterprise. And it's like, hey guys, you know, some of us are using ARM chips in embedded products. And so we got to keep, make sure that we keep our presence felt um, with the ARM community. Um, but there were some papers, and that's all been reported on LWN.net. Uh, and there were some good presentations of plumbers, especially. Uh, Arnd gave kind of his status of uh, the ARM community, and, and so that's worth looking at. Um, so next slide. Uh, mini core dumps. So this is, I just wanted to comment on this one because uh, it's very similar to a project I was working on last year. So Thomas Blackstone has uh, got this project to dump sparse core images has a configuration-driven user agent, so you can tell it at runtime what types of things you want to store. But it only stores the core dump with trusted information. So you can save basic register information, backtraces. And it only saves parts of the process image. Um, it does not save the entire image, and uh, but it keeps it in the kind of an ELF-compatible format. The interesting thing about this is that it's a new approach to doing core dumps. People have never done core dumps on embedded because you never have enough space to save the images. Uh, well, what this system does is on the host, it will take that sparse file and it'll actually backfill the core dump with the text and the read-only data and uh, it'll reconstruct as much of it as it can and then you can actually open up this file with GDB. And so you can use normal core dump tools, uh, but actually on target, it's got a much smaller footprint. Um, and so there are certain classes of embedded devices where this would be really, really handy. Uh, 
Um, it still won't address the needs of your really, really small systems. You can't even, even the sparse core dump is going to be several, probably in the hundreds of K. Uh, but, uh, and, but for certain classes of devices, if you're willing to give up a couple hundred K, uh, you can get an almost complete core dump and see a lot more debug information for your, your process images. So that's something to watch. Um, he'll be rolling that out and talking about that more in the future. Um, and that's last thing, uh, Stack Overflow, using a Stack Overflow, Raspberry Pi is very interesting. Uh, I won't get into all that, I'm kind of running over time. Uh, Elinux Wiki, I do want to talk about one thing real quick. Uh, a couple of new projects that we're doing. Uh, we're doing a video transcription project and a topic by topic cleanup. And we'll kind of announce these later, but I want to give you a little bit of a preview. So next slide. So on the video transcription project, uh, we haven't advertised this yet, but our plan is to ask volunteers to provide written versions of the presentations from the events. So we're going to set up a system so people can go in and uh, make it very easy to for volunteers to uh, to write the transcriptions for the presentations. So we have a whole lot of presentations. We've been recording presentations for VLC for almost six years now and ELC Europe. And so we have literally hundreds of presentations, but if most people don't go back and look at them uh, for a couple of reasons, because it takes kind of an hour investment of time to go watch them. And uh, they're not searchable. You don't know if there's something in there that you'd like. And so what we want to do is we want to get written transcriptions for all of those. Um, and so again, this has still not been advertised. The, the whole idea is that we're going to crowdsource this so as a volunteer, you don't have to transcribe a whole hour's worth of video. Uh, you can do as little as one minute of video and just kind of help the effort. And so this type of thing you can do on your lunch hour while you're you know, munching on a sandwich. You could go do watch one minute of video and, and help out the effort. So our idea is to crowdsource this project, but we'll announce more details. We're still defining the process and creating the templates and doing some experimenting around. I'll likely announce that at ELC Europe. We think this will be really handy to get all of that great embedded Linux content that we've uh, recorded over the years and will record in the future uh, into a, a more usable text form. Uh, next slide. Okay, resources. Next slide. The standard places I get from lwn.net. Uh, I get all my stuff. Colonel Dubay's always has great information. Elinux Wiki, especially if you're interested in a particular topic, make sure you go to the events page and look for the slides. Um, check out the events that are there. Uh, and then the C Linux dev mailing list. So with that, I thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully I've not gone too fast. If you have any questions, I'm uh, more than happy to answer them. Yes, Dave. Uh, do you have uh, some introduction of the uh, ELC Europe, which is upcoming? Um, can you pick up some of the topics within the ELC Europe, which is expected? Um, yeah, I, I will. Uh, I will try to do it from memory. We have uh, what was kind of a big topic this year. Usually, every year there's usually a couple topics that stand out, and I'm trying to remember this year. Um, let me see. So we have a fair, we have some good Android talks. Uh, we've got a couple of good. Um, I'm trying to remember how many PM talks we had. We don't have uh, a lot on boot up time. We do have a little bit. We have a couple of robotics talks. Um, robotics. And if you go to, if the actually the schedule is already up. So if you go to events.linuxfoundation. And uh, you can go actually to the Embedded Linux Conference schedule. Now the schedule is not finished yet, so um, we are still moving stuff around. So don't actually plan, you know, plan what sessions you're going to go to yet. But you can see almost everything that's on there is. Um, uh, where to go? I'm trying to get there myself. Uh, let's see, schedule. There we go. Um, so there's going to be some great stories. Uh, a lot of stuff about uh, uh, a fair amount of real time, actually, at this one. So there's a couple of really good talks about real time. Uh, actually, Samsung will be talking about their new flash file system. 
there are there are there is a little bit about boot time. Um, uh, so an NFC talk. Uh, let's see. And we have we have one or two philosophical talks. We have the. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know Chris Simmons, but he's uh, talking about the end of embedded Linux. You know, difference between kind of standard embedded and um, and uh, these platform embedded. You know, Android. A lot of people don't think of Android as kind of a traditional embedded Linux team. But there's some really good. Oh yeah, there's some really good uh, debugging talks. Uh, there's a board bring up talk by Dave Anders. That's always really popular. Um, and let's see. Eclipse, uh, a couple of things about Eclipse. Of course, with Yocto, if you go to the conference, if you're starting to use Yocto, there's a Yocto Developer Days uh, session after after the event. And there's actually, uh, and then we'll have, uh, you know, there'll be an interview with Linus. Linus will be there. Um, and uh, some good talks on, like I said, debugging seems to be a really good topic. And um, the, uh, let's see, what's the other one? Oh, the tools, some some good tools, talks. Uh, anyway, so kind of a little bit of everything. Uh, so some graphics talks, and, and uh, yeah, and in fact, there's a software crash analysis in TV. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that one. That's uh, uh, Thursday, Wednesday afternoon. Um, and then, of course, we'll have our fun closing game. We always do something fun, and we're planning our technical showcase on. Uh, Monday night, we'll have some good boss, uh, different topics. Anyway, so I highly recommend if you can make it over to uh, Europe. Uh, I know not everybody can, but uh, if you uh, are interested in those topics, please join us. We would love to have you. See you over there. So. Any questions? Uh, it's wrong, wrong uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm <laughs> sorry. It was so long. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, maybe question. I think you are writing some, some, you know, something in the uh, uh, Twitter that is uh, you need some uh, guidance about uh, for, well, uh, number like that. Uh, device three. I see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, um, uh, uni universal system mesh is coming in. So uh, I have to study uh, device three recently. So I and sometimes study hard. <laughs> Uh, and I'm checking uh, the wiki site and uh, so and documentation. And uh, uh, if uh, I wonder uh, if anyone uh, shows some a very uh, easy uh, session for device three, it, I I can do it. It's very helpful. <laughs> Yeah, that is, you know, I have uh, actually thought about that a lot. Um, over the summer, you know, I have not, I don't, I don't write board support packages very often. I use them, but I don't write them myself. And I've been worried that there's not very good documentation. I think everybody has kind of gotten used to, well, there wasn't very good documentation on ATACs either, quite frankly. <laughs> but, uh, but I worry that there's not a uh, very good kind of, uh, documentation or presentations about device tree to help developers kind of get used to the new system. And uh, so um, I will I will look around and see if I see something. I saw some patches go by uh, on the kernel mailing list. I Well, it actually was on the ARM mailing list, uh, where someone said, well, here's how I did device tree. And, and you could look at their patches. And I think it would be good maybe to get something on the eLinux website uh, talking about, um, you know, pointing to some of those examples and seeing if there are some kind of device tree tutorials that might be worth putting together uh, to help to help people ease into doing it. I, you know, as with any new thing in the kernel, you kind of have to learn it, and uh, there should be a lot of examples by now. But sometimes um, it's good to see kind of the how you get into it and step into it. I know Paul Walmsley. 
uh, was it Paul Walmsley or Simon Horman? Well, one of the developers I saw said, you know, look, here's a new platform, here's how I did the device tree on it, and I'll, I will see if I can go back and find that reference and put it on the eLinux wiki or something. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good. You said Simon Horman? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember who it was. I, it was uh, someone whose name I recognized. Uh, added added a new board and did it in device tree and actually pointed out said you know here's how I did the device tree stuff you know and so it was kind of a set of patches I you know so it would be good to get those documented somewhere I think quite frankly I think that there ought to be a document in the kernel documentation tree I think there's one that talks about like the structure and format of device tree but I think there should be like a porting guide there should be a like how to write a BSP guide yeah, or something. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> the problem with docs like that is that they get out of date really quick. But I should I should talk to Arn. Maybe Arn has seen the same thing. Uh, but no, that's a good that's a good comment. Good request. Thank you very much, Tim, and uh, we'd like to get into lunchtime, and I hope you to have a good evening. Okay, yes, thank you. See you again. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.